Something was dead in all of us, and what was dead was hope. That line from Reading Jail captured the spirit that was in the people of Israel in exile. And God called a prophet and helped them to sing the Lord's song again. He gave the prophet what later he gave to Israel through the prophet. We read from the 37th chapter of Ezekiel and discover what God is able to do for people, for institutions, for churches, for you, and for me. Hear the word of the Lord. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass among them around about, and behold, there were many in the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, O oh Lord God, only thou knowest. Again he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life. And I will put sinews on you, and make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, that you may come alive. And you will know that I am the Lord God. So I prophesy as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. There was a rattling. And the bones came together, bone upon bone. And as I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, and there was no breath in them. And he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath. O oh, come and breathe on these slain, that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they came to life. And they stood on their feet, an exceeding great army. And then the Lord said to me, Son of man, these bones are the house of Israel. May God add his blessing to this reading from his holy word. Let us pray. O oh, almighty God, we identify with the dry bones in the valley. For so much of our life is dead and without breath, so much in us that needs to be brought back to life. Thank you that you are a God of resurrection, a God who raises us up out of the grave of our own making and our own faking. We thank you that you come to us and give us a new chance, a new beginning. Now teach us in this scripture what it really means to have breath, the breath of life, the Holy Spirit infused into us. In the name of Christ, the resurrection and the life, amen. The other day I went into my favorite health food store and uh, ordered one of those potent protein potions. They put about everything in the whole store into one of uh, those drinks and they whirl it up and uh, when you drink it, you feel all the energy uh, <laughs> pulsing through your body. Well, while I sat there drinking this health food drink, I looked at a great big poster on the side of the wall. 
And the title was a mixed metaphor, if I've ever seen one. It said, A Fat Chance Diet. Well, now, I wondered what that was. And so I read the description of it underneath the title, and it said this, A Last Chance Diet When All Else Has Failed. Ah, well, you're way ahead of me. You know exactly what I did with that for days. It rumbled around in my mind, and suddenly I thought, what would it be like to find a last chance spiritual diet? You ever felt that you uh, had run out of steam and you needed a last chance? What would be a last chance diet for those who have given up hope? Hmm. Have you ever known a time when all else has failed? I have, and it was the beginning of a new life for me. Some of you feel it uh, in relation to your health, and you wonder, I've tried everything. Nothing has worked. Is there a last chance? Some of us feel it in marriage, others in friendship, others on the job, others in the community. Others feel it about themselves. Is there something that I could do, delete, be, for a last chance diet? Ezekiel spoke to the people of Israel when all else had failed. It was at the lowest ebb of Israel's history. Ezekiel was born in 621. During the first 25 years of his life, he, for, he saw four kings deposed. He saw the gold taken out of the temple and used as tribute to the encroaching enemies. And then, along with Jehoiakim, he was carried off to Babylonia, along with the cream of the crop of Judah's people. And there for five years he watched the people settling into the land. And he wondered, could the Lord bless them there when they faced their last chance? And then the Lord came to him, and he gave him an experience that's recorded in the second chapter of Ezekiel. He gave him three admonitions. The first was, stand up. The second was, eat the book. And the third was, receive the Spirit. Not a bad uh, last chance diet, is it? He got him up on his feet, got him at attention so that he could hear and receive and respond. I had a marvelous experience recently preaching to a group of the evangelical covenant pastors. And there was a cluster of black pastors among them who taught me a great deal during the few days that I was there. And we had a wonderful conversation as I preached. And often, they would respond by saying, yes, sir. Well, wow, it so shocked me. I went on, and I preached another point, and then another. And to each, they said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, that's the kind of response Ezekiel gave the Lord. He got on his feet, and he said, yes, sir. And he responded. And the Lord filled him with his spirit. And then he offered him the scroll of the guidance and the direction of God, and he said, eat the book. Eat the scroll, eat my words, digest them, make them a part of every fiber of your being so that your blood pulsating through the tissues and nerves of your being will be faithful and obedient to me. No wonder the Lord blessed him in that way, because he had a lot that he wanted him to do. He lived through the excruciating days of the final decline of Jerusalem, and then in 586 the city fell to the Babylonians the battles were fought, and the news of the depleted state, both nationally and politically and spiritually, reached those bereft Jews in Babylonia. Has God forgotten us? And the man whom the Lord had prepared gave Israel a last chance diet that worked. The Lord came to him and said, It's not all over. I'm just beginning. I'm going to give you a new spirit and a new heart, and I'm going to take out of you the heart of stone and put in you a heart of flesh. What he really meant was this, that that obdurate, negative, hostile, angry heart was going to be replaced with a heart of flesh that would be open and supple and receptive and willing. And then the Lord gave Ezekiel a vision. 
Perhaps there were various things that contributed to the vision. It's always the case that the Lord uses what's happening around us, perhaps what's happening historically, and what's been said around us, and then gives us a vision that lifts us out of it all. The proverbial saying among the Jews in Babylonia was, our bones are dried up within us. All hope has departed. We are clean, cut off. That's how they felt. And then there was an event outside of Jerusalem where the Hebrews were actually slaughtered and the skin and flesh was flayed off of their bones and left in a valley to rot and dry. And we wonder if that's what Ezekiel thought of. But the most important thing was that the Lord lifted him up in the spirit and brought him to a valley that was strewn with dry bones. You can't understand the vision unless you go down near the end of that 37th chapter where the Lord interprets it all. And he said, Ezekiel, son of man, those bones are the house of Israel. Now, look at the whole thing in the light of that. And suddenly you realize that what the Lord was doing through Ezekiel was to give him an experience so that he could know what was happening to his people and that the Lord would have the final word. He looked at the valley. The bones were all separated. and They were very dry. And then the Lord said, Son of man, can these bones live? And with humility, but acknowledging the condition of Israel, he said, Oh, Lord, only you know. And then the Lord said, O oh, son of man, prophesy to those bones. And he did. And suddenly, the bones which were unconnected were connected bone to bone, joint to joint. And then by the wonder of the grace of God, there were sinews put on those bones, and then flesh, and then on top of the flesh, skin. And Ezekiel looked down into the valley again. And this time, it was made up of corpses and no breath. And then the Lord said, prophesy again. Prophesy to the wind. Say to the wind, fill those bodies. And then what had been bones now made bodies, now was animated not just with a resuscitation but with a resurrection, and the dead were raised up and they walked around. What does it mean, this strange vision? What does it mean to you and to me? Two things. And the first is, oh, own the bones. Why did God say, can these bones live? It was to help Ezekiel come to grips with the fact that they were dead. Israel had to come to the realization that they had turned against their Lord and their deadness was a result of that. They were separated from him. To own the bones is to stop blaming someone else or something else. The Lord says you are dead in comparison to the life I want to have in you. You are dead in comparison to the life that I have written across the pages of the book of Acts. You are dead in comparison of the spirit-filled, animated, vital, and dynamic people I want you to be. And we say, Oh, Lord, these bones can live. One of the most uh, painful and yet rewarding experiences is to talk to contemporary pastors and church officers and members and live through the recognition of the bones. I see it happening all over this country. God is touching people, helping them to recognize that they're dead, that though they are religious, they do not have life in them, that they're missing the power ingredient of the Christian life, which is the indwelling spirit of the living God. We are dead whenever we cannot love with warmth and inclusiveness and forgiveness. 
We are dead whenever we cannot forgive. We are dead whenever we are exclusive and hold people at arm's length. We are dead when inside of our hearts there is a stone instead of a pulsating heart of flesh that loves and cares and becomes involved. Probably the greatest detriment to being set afire by the Holy Spirit is religion itself and the institutional church. We hold off at all costs coming to the place of saying we're part of the dead bones in the valley. We try and perpetuate old program and old forms and old ideas rather than catching up with the living God. There's a great difference between our previous experience of God and an intimate experience of God right now. And God can begin to give life to churches and people whenever they say, those are our bones. We're dead in comparison to what it means to really be alive. Well, what's the second point? And it's this. Once you own the bones, you disown the bones. The Lord said to Ezekiel, prophesy to those bones. He had to have confidence that the Lord was going to do something. He was going to take those dead bones and make them alive. And so too he gives us that quality of hope. He gives us an image of what we are going to be like filled with his spirit. What word would capture what you are going to be like filled with his spirit? Forgiving, accepting, gracious, kind, warm, inclusive. Take that word and claim it and then recognize that you can't do it as long as you're part of the valley of the dead bones, that you need the Holy Spirit of God to do it. He alone can empower the dead bones. Disown what you've been. God gives us demarcation lines in which we can say that's past and a new beginning. Thank God for Good Friday, but also praise God for Easter. But the period in between means that we die with Christ in a death like His so that we can be raised with Him in a resurrection like His. It's only when we surrender our dead bones that God can raise us up. Now, I don't like to participate in what I think is the irrelevant discussion in our time about when the Holy Spirit is baptized on a believer. The Holy Spirit is the author of our total process of salvation and baptism and sanctification. He's the one who comes to us and convinces us of our need, the one who convinces us of the efficacy of Jesus Christ, helps us to know that he died for us and was raised up for us, gives us the gift of faith to respond, and then we begin to live the Christian life, and it isn't long before we run out of steam. We try harder. And we have a choice there at the crossroads of either becoming religious and adding to our life a lot of rights and rules and regulations and duties and responsibilities so all we get is grim. The other way is to be filled with his spirit and to live his life by his power. The dead bones in the valley of the churches in America is made up of those who have made the wrong choice at the crossroads and are trying to live the Christian life on their own strength for the glory of God, and it won't work. Own the bones. Disown the bones. Experience the resurrection. As Christ was raised up, we can be raised up. As he returned with the power of the Holy Spirit to fill his disciples, he comes now. Every day is Pentecost. We were meant to be the containers and transmitters of the very living Spirit of God. Prophesy to the bones, Ezekiel, the breath of God, the Ruach, his pneuma, his indwelling Spirit is here with you right now. And then we can pray. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Wean it from earth. Through all its pulses move. Stoop to my weakness, mighty as thou art. And make me love thee as I ought to love.